Good morning. Good morning. Hey, nice to see you all. We are in Luke chapter 1 this morning, so if you'd uh, take the Bible that I'm sure you brought to Sunday school and turn to Luke chapter 1. I think what I'm going to do is run through the sanctuary and grab about, not this morning, but in the future, grab about 15 Bibles. Nobody would notice, would they? Spirit them into the gymnasium so all of you can be sure to have a Bible. If on the off chance that you happen to forget to bring yours, you'll have one available. And uh, in any event, I really encourage you to bring your Bibles. It uh, encourages me when you have them there. We are in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 57. In spite of all of the great plans, of course, that I made early on about how rapidly we were going through Luke, we're still in chapter 1, so... But it's a long chapter, and I'm not apologizing yet. We are going to finish chapter 1 this morning, this remarkable concluding prophetic statement that we hear from Zechariah, which is commonly called the Benedictus. So we'll be looking at that as we uh, proceed this morning. But we'll be starting at verse 57. You recall the first two chapters in most outlines of the book of Luke are called the birth narratives. And obviously that's the simplest way of describing them, and that certainly is what's going on. But behind that, as we've said, is that too loud? That's pretty loud, isn't it? Is that too hot? Is it okay? All right. Um, as we've said before, uh, Luke has more things in mind than just giving us an account of the births of both John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. He wants also to, in a sense, get his major themes on the table before us. And so we find repeated references, in some cases in a subtle way, to some of the things that he's going to remind us of all the way through this course of study that we're going to be pursuing here. Uh, one of the most important things, however, that comes to our attention, and we've mentioned this before, is simply that both John the Baptist and Jesus are pictured as being way on the outside. They're on the very fringes of that which others would describe as being where the action is. They are not where the action is. They seem to be far, far away from it. And Luke is going to be describing for us how Jesus especially is going to, as it were, invade foreign territory, that which has been taken by the enemy, and he's going to win it back. So he has this initial concept he wants to get over to us, that Jesus is on the outside, way out there, but he'll start narrating for us how the, uh, the attack, as it were, begins. All right, this morning, in any event, we're in uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 57. We'll take this in two little bites, so we'll read down to verse 66, first of all, and then we'll go ahead and take the uh, last part of the chapter. So, Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 57. This is the Word of God. Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he's to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. So there's our initial text. Let's ask God's blessing on our reflection on it. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you give us once again this opportunity to think about the remarkable circumstances of the birth of Jesus as well as the birth of John. These two who came to the land of Israel, John to prepare the way, and Jesus to usher in this kingdom that had been so long anticipated. We pray that as we reflect on the narrative that's before us this morning, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, 
hearts to accept these things. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, line by line here, verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. So we've reached that point now, nine months hence, from the time that Zechariah heard the initial announcement that a son would be born. Uh, we have the impression, at least, that Mary didn't stick around for the birth. Not quite sure why, but by this time she apparently has gone home, back to Nazareth, and Elizabeth, in any event, now gives birth to this uh, very, very overdue son. I mean overdue in the sense that uh, they'd been hoping for a son for years and years, and now finally uh, this joyful moment comes for them. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. You recall that when the angel said to Zechariah, uh, that his wife Elizabeth would have a son, he also said, and many will rejoice at his birth. And this is the beginning of that. So we have the clan, we have the family, we have those immediate people who were acquainted with Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they obviously are sharing in this remarkable moment of rejoicing, and thus it begins. But of course, that's not where it ended. And as the years went by, of course, many, many more would rejoice in the birth of John the Baptist. Eventually, he would be one of the most famous and important and influential people in Israel. We know that not simply from the New Testament, we know it from Josephus, that John the Baptist became a person of considerable and conspicuous influence in that land. And there were huge numbers of people who resorted to him, who went out to hear him preach, and they rejoiced. They were overflowing with that sense that God had come back and once again was visiting his people. And for that, of course, they were filled with a sense that God had not forgotten them, that uh, God still had something good in store for them. And so we hear, for example, Luke will tell us, uh, speaking in a bit of a hyperbole, all Judea went out to be baptized by John the Baptist. We know that Luke was a little over the top there because, in fact, not everybody was baptized. Uh, John had a few people that were his detractors. He had those folks who didn't so much share the joy in his birth, but actually viewed him as something of a threat. They weren't exactly sure what to make of him. They uh, went out somewhat critically appraising his ministry, and they would stand off and sort of look at him from afar. And, of course, for them, John had nothing but the most harsh uh, kinds of comments, you know, who warned you to flee, you brood of vipers, you know, that kind of thing. Didn't uh, win any points with them, actually, when he spoke to them that way. But uh, So it did split the crowd, but certainly many rejoiced, and it all began here at this moment of the birth of John the Baptist. On the eighth day, continuing, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. There's no precedent in the Old Testament for naming the child at the child's circumcision. However, by the first century, it had become customary to do so. And so they are following the practice that more or less was conventionally uh, the case that when the child was circumcised, his name would be given to him. Circumcision, you know, in the Old Testament was that external visible mark which indicated a person was a member of the visible covenant community. Not every circumcised person was guaranteed salvation, but it was a way of identifying oneself visibly with the visible community of the people of God. And so circumcision was the mark. It was first, of course, uh, given to Abraham and continued to be practiced down through the history of God's people. It was, by the first century, customary to give a name to the child at that time, because I think in the Jewish mind, it became part of the understanding that in a sense, the identity of the person was related to the community to which they were attached. And so the name was given as part of that almost sacramental, ceremonial process. We, of course, do something like that in Christian history. And even in our own church, you know, when we baptize infants, the uh, pastor will ordinarily ask the parents, what is the Christian name of this child. Now, that doesn't mean the parents gave him a different name earlier, and now it's changing, but the idea is that the identity of this child 
is to be regarded as part of that child's attachment to the Christian community. What's the Christian name? You know, we didn't invent that. That's been happening for a long time. And there was a time in church history when, especially if an adult was baptized, the name would change. So a person is baptized into the Christian community, they're given a different name. Following the principle that in the Bible, uh, or in the, in the idea of the, you know, the biblical uh, uh, the notion here, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, Paul says, 2 Corinthians. Hence a new name. You know. And uh, so the, something like that seems to be going on here. You think about how significant names are, how much they capture the idea of who you are. Uh, biblically, names change. Jacob becomes Israel. Uh, Cephas becomes Peter. Uh, and it makes me at least ponder, you know, what is my name? What's your name? What would you name yourself? You know, the Native Americans had a wonderful practice of kind of naming children for expressions of the natural order. There's running deer. There's bubbling brook, you know. What's your name? That's my question. How would you answer that? Just in your own musings here. What would your spouse name you? Are those the same name? <laughs> you know, what would God name you? What would God's name be? In the Jewish mind, the name was very much at the very core, as it were, of who a person was, and that's why names are used in that way. Well, these folks come together and they're going to name this child in honor of his father, Zechariah. Ordinarily, in the Jewish world of the first century, a child, of the firstborn male child, would be named for the grandfather. And hence the name would kind of skip a generation, but it will always perpetuate the name, you know. But here, uh, it's like Zechariah was already old enough to be his grandfather, probably his great-grandfather, and so they want to cut to the chase. They're going to name this child in honor of his father. And, of course, they're somewhat surprised at the response the parents make to that. His mother said, no, he is to be called John, Iones, Yahweh saves. He's to be called John. Nothing wrong with the name John, but the neighbors, the relatives, are somewhat perplexed, and they object, saying, well, none of your relatives has that name. That's not a family name. You know, the name is supposed to reflect the attachment. The name says what family you're in, what clan you're in, what your associations are, your birth, your connections. Nobody here is called John, but, of course, the name was showing a different connection. John was bigger than his clan. John was bigger than those immediate birth associations. His name was assigned by God. He will be called John. Yahweh saves. Well, the relatives aren't so sure about that, so they go to the higher authority here, and they begin motioning to the father to find out the name he wanted to give. It was ordinarily the father's prerogative. It was a frankly patriarchal society, and it would be up to the father. Now, normally, the father would, you know, consult with the wife. It wasn't dictatorial in the ordinary course of events, but the final decision would be with him. It's interesting that they began motioning to him, which implies he was either hard of hearing or deaf. We don't, we don't know if that was part of the discipline that came by virtue of Gabriel, Gabriel didn't say, you will be mute and deaf, you know, for nine months. But some have thought maybe it was a package deal. Maybe Zechariah was not only prevented from speaking, but even prevented from hearing. So the last words he would have heard for nine months would be those words of chastening for his lack of faith. I don't know. Nobody does. Some have thought maybe he was just hard of hearing because he was getting old. Nobody here knows anything about that, I'm sure, but in any event, they motion to him, you know. What are you going to call him? He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. All of them were amazed. Obviously, here, Zechariah is acting in obedience to what Gabriel had instructed him. In the Bible, it's vastly the norm 
that the superior, the parent, names the inferior, the child. That that right of naming is related to the one who is in the superior role. We are not ordinarily given the right to name ourselves. In the Bible, you don't find that. But sometimes God will come along and pull rank and say, even though normally the parents do it, now I'm going to preempt, as it were, that parental responsibility and name the person myself. And that is the case here. So Zechariah acts in obedience to that, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. What he spoke, the first word of what he spoke in Latin was benedictus. And that, of course, was picked up later in the church's history, and the so-called benedictus is a reference to this prophetic prayer that's offered by Zechariah. So we have the Magnificat related to Mary and the Benedictus related to Zechariah. It has been used in the liturgy of the church in various quarters throughout its history. Both of those have been commonly used, and so uh, they became more or less you know, part of the life and culture and bloodstream of the church over the years. But here, of course, is the first presentation of it. So John is, or uh, Zechariah is free to begin speaking, and the first thing he does is praise God. And we'll hear the words of that in just a moment. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. Fear came over those who heard these things. I put my watch here because otherwise I'd keep you until about noon. You know, this is a way of sort of keeping myself on track. Luke goes out of his way to remind us of the effect on the people who are around when God acts. And he will routinely reference it in terms of fear. Uh, more than any other gospel writer, Luke reminds us of that aspect of the human response. Certainly Mark does and Matthew does and John does as well. But with Luke, it's obviously a, an, an intentional and rather studied uh, part of his, his message. It's thematic to him. I think you could, I haven't tried this, so I don't want to, some of you may test me on this, but I, he does it so frequently that I almost think you could drop Luke open randomly at any, pa any page of the gospel or even of Acts and find some passing reference to fear in the lives of people who are seeing God's hand at work. Now, there's a certain kind of fear in the Bible that's healthy. Martin Luther, you may recall, distinguished between what he called servile fear and filial fear. Servile fear is the fear of someone simply because they have the raw power and probably don't mean you any good. This is the fear of a, you know, a, a prisoner toward a torturer. Servile fear. It's the fear that causes us to just quiver in the corner, you know, in, in raw kind of paralysis of anxiety. Whereas the uh, filial fear that Luther speaks of is a very different kind of thing. It's truly fear, but it's fear of one not simply because of their power, but because of their authority, because of their dignity, even because of their majesty, or in a word, biblically, because of their holiness. And the one who really provokes that true, deep sense of fear is, of course, God, and those who are acting on God's behalf in some distinct and recognizable sense. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, you know. There is that trembling that comes by virtue of seeing God at work. And Luke wants to remind us of that. You may recall in the book of Acts how frequently he'll say, and fear came on the multitude. Ananias and Sapphira struck dead, and fear, I mean, in that case, not too surprisingly, but fear, sweeps through the community and even the external community. When God acts, we notice, you know. And here we have fear sweeping through the neighborhood. And these things were talked about. Who, uh, all who heard them pondered them and said, what then will this child become? And the intriguing circumstances provoke all kinds of speculation, and I assume some of that speculation may have been pretty bizarre. Uh, Luke doesn't bother to tell us, but certainly there was a sense that something here was 
something here was unusual and it was something to keep your eye on. For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. That's a wonderful and common anthropomorphism in the Bible. The hand of the Lord was with him. The arm of the Lord was with him. We need the hand of the Lord with us. We can do nothing without the hand of the Lord. And it's a wonderful figurative way of saying God has to be in it. I hope and pray when I come in to teach Sunday school that in some very modest sense God's hand is with me and with you as you endure this presentation. Because unless God's hand is in it, it's all in vain. It's futility. We should be doing something more constructive. But if God is here, if his hand is with us, then it's worth our time and worth our attention. And certainly in the case of John, we have a case where the hand of the Lord was with him in a powerful way that, that jolted uh, the entire nation, and really in some ways the entire world, because John the Baptist had followers throughout the Jewish world of the Mediterranean of that day. All right, this brings us now to this great prophetic uh, statement that uh, Zechariah gives us, we're at verse 67. We'll read down to the end of the chapter, and then as time permits, go back and pick up some of the details. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our fathers and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. So there's our Benedictus. Then the father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Yes, I know I've mentioned it before, and I'll probably keep mentioning it again. Just notice how frequently Luke reminds us of that. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord, came upon him, and he spoke. And we're going to see throughout Luke culminating in Acts, however, that idea, the Spirit of the Lord comes and people speak. Jesus said to his disciples right before his ascension, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will speak. You will be my witnesses. This is God's great tool in our world, the weapon that we wield is the weapon of speaking God's word. And here we see an example, and we'll see it many, many times as we go along, that the spirit of the Lord comes on someone and they speak. And as they speak, things happen. So Zechariah has this anointing, as it were, of God's spirit, and he spoke. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. As I said, the Latin word blessed is benedictus. It's the first word of this prophecy, and by that it gets its name. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has looked favorably on his people and redeemed him. Actually, the Greek carries a notion of a, has visited his people, and I, that, I prefer that would have been uh, uh, retained. He has visited his people. It was very important to the people of God to have, from time to time, a visitation. For the people of God, the presence of God was the source of blessing. But the absence of God 
put them in a hard place. The absence of God implied the curse. The presence of God implied the blessing. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you shalom, the idea of God's presence, God's face. But of course, for the people of Israel, they hadn't been visited through a prophetic messenger for a long, long time. It had been about 430 years, to be exact. Since God had visited his people through a divine messenger, a prophet. That prophet was Malachi, and the last words he had spoken were that someday in the future, Elijah would come, the great and awful day of the Lord would come, and the people from that moment on were set to waiting. Now, 430 years is a long time to wait. You know. I mean, what were you doing 430 years ago? That's a lot of national history. 430 years ago, what was happening? The Spanish Armada in round numbers, you know. That's how far back that is. Our national history hadn't even begun. I mean, as a nation, we haven't been around that long. And that's how long Israel had been waiting, waiting, waiting. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, waiting, you see. And there had been a lot of cynicism, a lot of loss of heart. And these days, of course, were ones when it seemed as if virtually all was lost. Israel was ruled by this powerful, corrupt oligarchy in the back pocket of Rome. The very worship in the temple had been turned into something of a sort of preposterous circus joke from the point of view of true worshipers. It really seemed as if, you know, things were lost. And now Zechariah acknowledges that finally at long last, God has looked favorably. God has visited his people to redeem them. It is interesting that Zechariah begins not by celebrating his own personal joy. He might have done that. He might have said something, you know, about what a meaningful thing this was to him personally, to have a son and to have a son who was going to be used so mightily. But Zechariah's first thought is for his people. And he's thinking in the big picture, the big scheme of things, as we all should. He's looked favorably on his people. He's raised up a mighty savior for us in the house of his servant David. Now, some of you may have translations that render that somewhat more accurately. And if you're using this Bible, you'll notice in the footnote, the word for savior is actually the word horn. Horn. Which was a common metaphor in the Old Testament for a warrior, a powerful warrior. He was called a horn. You'll hear expressions like the horn of Israel, you know, that kind of thing. Horn there does not mean a horn like a trumpet uh, that you might play, you know, nor does it mean a horn as in the horns of the altar, which some have thought, but it actually means a horn as a weapon. And the picture there is, for example, a bull that has those horns on his head. Now, you may not worry too much about that till you're out in a meadow with one of those beasts running at you and that horn is leading the way, you know, then all of a sudden you have a sense that's where the great power of that beast is concentrated. That horn is the most, you know, destructive uh, aspect of his anatomy at that particular moment. And Israel picked up that idea and would use the term to apply to great military characters. They were the horn of Israel as if Israel were a mighty bull, and that, you see, leading the way, leading the charge, was that uh, powerful implement of destruction. And here, of course, Zechariah applies to Christ that expression. What I want you to notice about it is that it pictures Christ as a warrior. And Luke will bring us back to that again and again. We have many images we use to describe Christ. He's a shepherd, you know, that sort of thing. We have many different wonderful images. The one that you don't see very often, however, is Christ the warrior. I think it's partly our culture. Uh, the, you know, we don't like war and we have a kind of anti-war attitude. And I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just saying that I think culturally we sort of have an antipathy to a picture of Christ as a warrior, but the Bible doesn't. It views him very much in those terms, and Luke views him as being 
as it were, a commando, you know, kind of like the old Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. One man running into the thick of the battle all by himself, and he's going to win the victory. He doesn't have thousands of troops at his disposal. He's going in there just armed with his own, you see, resources to win this battle. And we're going to see again and again little hints of that. And here, of course, is one of them. He has raised up a mighty horn for us in the house of his servant David. And David, of course, was remembered more than anything else as the greatest warrior king of Israel. And, of course, echoing through this statement is the idea that David would have a son. The Davidic covenant would be realized eventually in one who would be a descendant of David, sitting on the throne, but in a sense, just as David had to qualify himself to be king by winning battles, he was a warrior first, then a king. So in a sense, the son of David is going to similarly win a great battle and then be able to say, all authority is given unto me, you see. So he's a warrior first, and then he wins, as it were, the right to be the king because of his conquests in battle. So God has come to our rescue. God has raised up for us a mighty savior. Now, I have a feeling Zechariah, as profound as this is, and I can't read his mind, so I'm way out on a limb here, I have a feeling Zechariah probably didn't even fully appreciate the profundity of what he was saying. He probably was thinking that Christ would come as one to liberate them from Rome, you know, from the political oppression. And you might say, in a sense, Jesus ultimately did that. But that wasn't the first item on his agenda. A battle with Rome would have been a pop-gun affair compared to the enemy that Jesus was going to tackle. He was going to take the tap root of evil behind Rome and make that the target of his warring uh, uh, expedition here. And so, uh, so uh, I, you know, we don't know what was in Zachariah's mind as he said these words, but uh, probably uh, he didn't even appreciate the half of it would be my guess, but I'm... I'm just speculating at that point. He raised up this mighty Savior the house of, in the house of his servant David as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. The Old Testament is teeming with this sense of expectancy that someday someone would come. Martin Luther said once that he believed you could find Christ on every page of the Old Testament, virtually in every verse. Uh, he believed that any reading of the Old Testament that was not Christocentric was misguided, that you had to read it with an eye toward the coming of this one who Zechariah is mentioning here. And I tend to agree. It seems to me as you read the Old Testament that it just increasingly thunders toward this great moment of expectancy when Messiah would come. And it goes way, way back. It goes clear back. You think of Genesis 3.15, the proto and the first announcement of the gospel. God is speaking, and he speaks oddly of the seed of the woman. Very unusual. The word there is, in Greek would be the sperma of the woman, you see, which is not expected. Almost there you have a little allusion to the virgin birth. The seed of the woman, and what would he do? He would crush the head of the serpent. He would crush this enemy, this one who had insinuated himself into the human situation and, as it were, uh, stolen away the proper loyalty of the human race and done such damage, who had become the great enemy. That first Adam lost it, but the last Adam would win it back. And when he goes to war, it's to do that very thing, to crush the head of the serpent, and all through the Old Testament, it's repeated and renewed and expanded and gains greater and greater color and force, and so you can't even read the New Testament without having this idea that there's something out there. And now Zechariah says, here it is. He spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Israel was in the hands of enemies in that day. Rome was an external enemy. These usurpers, as we've mentioned before, 
represented an internal enemy. And all of Israel was sort of reeling beneath the, the weight of this corrupt kind of coalition between religion and politics, which both of all had sold their soul to the devil, you know. And the people of God who wanted so much to worship God freely felt this constant oppression as if there was some consolidated effort to keep them from doing so. They were enemies. People in Israel who really loved the God of Israel felt they were dealing with enemies day in and day out, constantly laying siege to their desire to worship God. And Zechariah here is reflecting what was a heartfelt uh, frustration that really was throughout the entire psyche, as it were, of the Jewish people of that time. That we would be saved from our enemies and, and, enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. Of course, Abraham goes way before David, so we have both of these covenants brought to our attention. The Davidic covenant was within the broader context of the Abrahamic covenant. To Abraham, God had promised that he would bless all the nations of the world. It was a promise to Abraham and his seed. And we're told in the New Testament that the seed of Abraham was not just sort of in a broad sense the descendants of Abraham, was first and foremost Christ himself. Paul makes that point in Galatians chapter 3. And then Paul says anybody who is in Christ is seed of Abraham and heirs of the promises made to Abraham and his seed. That was a great oath that God had promised to his people. It had been renewed and repeated and enriched down through history, and, and Zechariah sees here the fulfillment of all of that. You can see how much he sees is happening here. This is the great moment that conditions all of history. This is what everything has been heading for, and from this point on, everything else is going to be unraveling the effects of it. This is the decisive moment in the history, not only of Israel, but in the history of the human race. And all of that, in a sense, is implied by the kinds of things that Zechariah says. This is the oath he swore to our father. He's rescuing us from the hands of our enemies so that we might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. How much of human history has been influenced by people simply seeking to worship God freely? How much of our own national history was conditioned by that concern? I realize that revisionist historians like to rethink that and say, well, these were just a bunch of people that were kind of trying to make a buck in the new world and so on, but don't you believe it, you know? I don't, I don't trot my, my uh, credentials in here very often, but I have a master's in Puritan history. That's what I was studying back there. You read what was going on in colonial America, and you cannot escape that these people came here to worship. They came here in order to be freed from a kind of oppressive regime that present, prevented them from worshiping God and from building what they called a New England predicated on the idea of a freedom to acknowledge and worship God's you know, ways among us. Now, obviously, there was other things going on. I'm not denying that. But to try to eliminate that piece is to take the guts right out of you know, one of the most important aspects of that. Well, how much of that has happened in history? And how much of it was happening here? How much were the people of God at that time simply seeking to be able to worship God freely? If a true worshiper of God went to the temple, and many did, there were pilgrimages, there were, you know, proselyte Jewish people that came to Jerusalem from all parts of the world, there were diaspora Jews who came, and they came to Jerusalem and they came in the hopes of finding this holy place, this place where they would just be elevated into the very presence of God and would sense that here, in a way unlike anywhere else on the planet, you could sense the presence of God in his holy temple, a house of prayer for the nations. And how disillusioned these folks would be when they finally showed up, you see, and found a carnival atmosphere 
people hawking wares. Step right up, ladies, look at this, you know, buy that. And this is kind of just outlandish sort of, uh, you know, expression of anything but a religious spirit was, was just in the air. You know, cotton candy and you name it, it was being sold. The Ferris wheels were turning and everything. And oh, by the way, you know, there's the temple in the middle of all that. That's what got Jesus so upset. So he grabbed a whip and started chasing him out. What's the matter with you people? Don't you know what's going on? That was what was in the experience of folks as they came to worship God. They just wanted to worship him. And the enemies were doing everything in their power to prevent it. We're going to let you worship God. At least we're going to try to distract you as best we can from doing it. You know. And the frustration that was being felt here was palpable. And Zechariah now raises this wonderful you know, expression of gratefulness that God was going to change that. Now Zechariah turns his attention to this child. I can imagine he actually was holding him in his arms, looking into his face in a very tender kind of expression here. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. You will be called a prophet of the Most High. John was a prophet. He was, as we said last week, the last Old Testament prophet. All of you in this room are so sophisticated, you don't even raise an eyebrow when I say that. You understand perfectly the meaning that even though we learn of John the Baptist in the New Testament, and he then hence appears to be a New Testament character, he is indeed an Old Testament figure because, of course, he lives and dies before the great events of redemption, before Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. John was already off the scene. He died in the Old Covenant era as the last and greatest prophet. Jesus says there was no one greater born of woman than John the Baptist. He gives him the most sweeping compliment that to my knowledge, he ever gave anybody, maybe with the exception of Peter, who he uh, made the first pope there, you recall, in um, Matthew 16. But what, a, what a, a statement, you see, to John the Baptist. The culmination of all of those prophets, Elijah, you know, Isaiah, Zechariah, great characters. And now it reaches its final expression in John the Baptist. You will be the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. He was a preparation. Isaiah, of course, in particular, speaks of the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight a highway for our Lord. Bring down the mountains, fill up the valleys, pave the road, so that this one, the Lord, can come in. You know. It's often been noted that while John the Baptist was a figure preparing the people of Israel for the coming of their Lord, in a sense all of us need a kind of John the Baptist, don't we, from time to time. Before we can fully appreciate the grace that comes through Christ, we need to almost feel that we're dangling just a bit over the precipice of hell. You don't really appreciate mercy until you've seen something of justice. You know, that's what brings it into sharp relief. And in some ways, that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was, he was warning these people of the wrath to come. He was telling them the time is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. The axe is laid at the root of the trees. His fan is in his hand. The fires are burning. This is it. You know, and people were starting to tremble in their boots. They were feeling the fire. And yet as they turned and repented and were baptized and as the old tune goes, you know, laid their burdens down at the riverside, they found such great joy in that as well. But this was his message. This was his purpose. You'll be called the prophet of the Most High. You'll prepare the way to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. John's message was also a message of forgiveness, a baptism of forgiveness. By the tender mercy of our Lord, the dawn will break the dawn, uh, sorry, from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
borrowing language from, uh, from Isaiah 9, where it says, those who sat in darkness saw a great light. And there, in particular, Isaiah mentions Galilee, which is where it all began, you see. This great light shines, lighting the way. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. The uh, impression seems to be that, I, that uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth probably didn't live a whole lot longer, maybe a few years, but they were elderly, and they seem to have passed from the scene. John seems to have been that kind of peculiar, sort of stark personality who wasn't just in it for fun and games and so on. He, very, from the very beginning, had this rather uh, severe kind of concern for purity of life, at least that's the report we get from uh, other sources, and it's certainly compatible with what we read here. And the impression is that as John was probably orphaned fairly early in his life, he goes into the wilderness. That was not uncommon in that day. There were many who abandoned the culture and went into the wilderness. There were numbers of little so-called kind of cloistered communities, people who were, in a sense, saying that this whole rotten mess is so corrupt, we're going to have nothing to do with it. This whole corrupt religion that's being perpetrated there in Jerusalem will have no part of it. The most famous community that took that view were called the Essenes. We never read of them in the Bible, but we know a lot about them from Josephus and especially from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Part of their conscious uh, sort of message and mission was to say that Jerusalem was totally off the rails, there was nothing legitimate happening there, and they were in fact in this little isolated community the only ones really worshiping God. They had a very apocalyptic outlook and so on, but uh, it wasn't uncommon and there were others like that. You see, they were in Qumran near the Dead Sea, but there were others like that who had just walked away, said enough of this. It's always been tempting in church history when it, when it seems to people that the church has lost its way to just go out into the wilderness. You know, we've had monastic movements and monastic figures down through history who've done something like that. And it seems that was part of what was uh, kind of the impulse of John here. Some have thought John may have actually been attached to or associated with the Essenes. Nobody knows, it's possible, but in uh, any event, he was... He was, uh, as it were, it seemed as if he was just walking away from it. But then at some point he comes back. That's what made him different. These others told the corrupt religion in Israel to just, you know, forget it. They just walked away. But John came back. Somehow or other, God touched him. He didn't come back, you know, to join the mainstream. He didn't come back to get a job selling insurance or something. He didn't come Nothing wrong with selling insurance, please understand, but he didn't come in. No, he came back to be a prophet. He came back to call these people to account. But he came, but you see, that in itself was an expression of his love. His concern brought him back, not abandoning them, but actually trying to reach them. And of course, we'll pick up that great drama of uh, John the Baptist soon enough, but we have to get Jesus born, so we're going to do that next week. Uh, when we come to one of the most familiar texts in all the Bible, uh, the birth narrative of Jesus uh, himself. So that's what's coming. I will stop right there. Thank you so much. Let's uh, close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this remarkable prophetic statement. We know that while it described, first of all, the unfortunate and unhappy circumstances of Israel in that first century setting. In some ways, it describes each of our lives as well, that each of us needs an invasion. Each of us needs a John the Baptist to call us to account, and we need to have a highway into our hearts in which the Lord can come and can sup with us, can have fellowship with us, can turn us around. We pray that we might see it that way and that we would open our hearts ever more deeply to the invasion of Christ who claims us and owns us so that we will love you with pure and holy hearts and we give you thanks for these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.